tonight. A bloody end to the siege as police storm the cafe in Martin Place. Two hostages, a mother of three and a young cafe manager, killed in the shootout. The gunman dead, a known extremist out on bail. Why was he free to walk our streets? The chilling calls made by hostages to Nine News from inside the siege. And a sea of flowers as Sydney unites in mourning. This is Nine News with Georgie Gardner. Good evening. It's been a day when Sydney has had to struggle with unexpected and unfamiliar pain. Two families left heartbroken and our city stripped of any illusion we're immune to terrorism. This is Martin Place right now, a sea of flowers left by hundreds of people expressing their sorrow and their support for those who are grieving. Our reporters are right across the city and Damien Ryan begins our coverage. Braced, even after all those hours, the police assault team on a knife edge. The flash of a muzzle-mounted spotlight. Here we go, here we go. Guys. Then more hostages making a run for freedom. It's followed by mayhem. Blasts of shotguns. Smashing at one door. Another blown open. Officers pouring into the cafe. has a barrage of stun grenades and gunfire exploded. The next 38 seconds would see success and tragedy. The death of the gunman, self-proclaimed Muslim cleric Man Haran Monas, an outcast within his own religion, shot dead by police. But the loss of two innocent Sydney lives the 34-year-old manager of the Lint Cafe, Tori Johnson, and mother of three, 38-year-old barrister, Katrina Dawson. In the chaos, there were other casualties. Four people stretched or carried out, injured but alive. The hellish end of the siege was forced on the police. They said they had no intention of storming the cafe, but that all changed with the pull of a trigger. There was a number of gunshots that were heard, um, which caused officers to move straight to uh, what we call an EA, an emergency action plan, and that caused them to enter. Bystanders unable to drag themselves away witnessed the extraordinary scenes. We heard more gunshots happening and all the police ran straight in and uh, it looked pretty scary. But yeah. It's very surreal and it's very shocking and I'm very disheartened with the whole situation unfortunately. The blast echoed around the streets sending a shudder through a nearby court building where the families of the hostages were waiting, among them Tory Johnson's father. His friends and colleagues today paid tribute. Tory was an amazing man. Um, we're all um, deeply saddened. He, you know, he, he really did love serving customers and he, he loved um, hospitality. The other victim, Katrina Dawson, a mother with three children under the age of 10, is believed to have suffered a cardiac arrest on her way to hospital. Her brother, a fellow barrister and father, this morning were too shattered to speak publicly. But at a memorial service in St Mary's Cathedral, Archbishop Anthony Fisher revealed how Katrina showed incredible bravery in the last moments of her life. Reports have also emerged that Katrina Dawson was shielding her pregnant friend from gunfire. These heroes were willing to lay down their lives so others might live. As you start to see uh, the stories uh, unfold of the, the victims whose lives had been lost, uh, it is hard uh, not uh, for our heart to become a little heavier. Uh, young Australians uh, with a huge future. The legal fraternity today honoured her, saying Katrina was one of our best and brightest barristers, who will be greatly missed by her colleagues and friends. Those close to them and those not. It didn't matter. It seemed everyone in Martin Place was feeling the pain. They brought flowers and kind thoughts. We've been watching it on the news all night and I suppose we just um, felt we wanted to pay some respects to these people. It is so sad. Very sad. 
very sad and I think it's a day that um, really defines a nation and it uh, will change us forever. All thanks to a man who was well known to police, man Haron Monis' radical views had put him on the radar. But yesterday he managed to slip under it when he took over the Lint Cafe with his gun and black flag. From the moment right in the middle of city centrepiece Martin Place, we wavered between hopes the siege would end peacefully and the nagging fear it could explode into a deadly finale. Hostages were forced to stand at the windows as the tormentor crept cautiously through the cafe, at times sheltering behind a human shield. There were glimmers of hope, the first hostages escaping as police seemed to make inroads with the negotiations. But then nothing for nearly 10 hours, the gunman turning out the cafe lights and then apparently drifting off to sleep. Some of the hostages saw him and they grabbed their chance. The group came out first and into the arms of police. And then a man on his own, he was spread eagle, checked and he was safe. Moments later, gunfire erupts inside the cafe and police push the button. has now been erected but early this morning behind it was where a hail of gunfire was unleashed with bullets flying and stun grenades exploding with people running for their lives. It was a scene of chaos and tragedy. It was also a scene of great courage. The police on the front line have been praised by the community, the Lint Company and their boss. I think they did an outstanding job. I too would like to commend the work of our police. While everyone might now second guess as to what's actually occurred in the last hours, well, um, they're the ones who had to make the decision. Our police had to actually deal with this incident. It was tough, exacting work. Many hours, whether they were on a point or whether they were part of a, a team that had to make that entry and deal with this situation. Um, I want to point out, they have saved lives. They have saved many lives. And to those men and women, all that were involved, we thank you. Their efforts to bring a peaceful end were ruined by the self-proclaimed shake. This afternoon his body was removed from the cafe he invaded and the city he terrified. Damien Ryan, Nine News. Reporters Lizzie Pearl and Simon Boder are at Martin Place. First to you Lizzie, what an extraordinary outpouring of grief there. Georgie, it's been quite remarkable and incredibly moving to stand here all day in Martin Place and watch this memorial steadily grow as the hours pass. Right now it's the busiest it's been all day here as people stop by on their way home from work and uh, take a couple of seconds to pause and think about exactly what happened here in the last 24 hours. There are people queued up right throughout Martin Place. They're waiting very patiently to have their chance to come in here place some flowers, stop, think, perhaps say a couple of prayers. It's not the usual bustling Martin Place that we're used to seeing. Instead, it's a quiet, gentle procession of ordinary Sydney-siders claiming back their city. The grief-stricken heart of Sydney blanketed in colour. A sea of flowers covering Martin Place. Weary eyes stared ahead, crying for people they never knew. It's very devastated. I just, I just can't believe that it's happened to our country. We've lost our innocence. Dignitaries, one by one, stopped in silence. Words weren't needed. Our Prime Minister and his wife, the Governor-General, the Premier, Police Commissioner and Governor. Etched in their faces, the sadness felt a city over. We will get through this. We are an incredibly strong people, it's a strong state, and we're very proud and it's something we hold very dear. So. They laid flowers and handwritten cards, all races, religions, colours, creeds, arm in arm, sharing their sorrow. Somehow what happened yesterday and last night is, is really a shocking news, it's not, it's not Australian. On behalf of the Jewish community, 
Our hearts go out to the families that have experienced this tragedy, and our country and our people are mourning together. For some, the tears just came. Others penned personal notes, faces of innocence, children, far too young to understand, but they know something isn't right. Businessmen in suits, the elderly, the young, quietly sharing a moment for the victims. We were evacuated yesterday. We didn't believe that something like this could happen in Australia. It's just so upsetting. It's just, yeah, come. We, we all just work just down the road, so it's very close to home. And um, this is all my team from work, so we decided to come out as a team effort and just uh, show our respects. It started before dawn with a single bouquet. Tears streamed down so many faces as tributes grew by the hour. Many simply had to come to Martin Place to see it for themselves. It's important for us all to stand together as Australians and show our uh, compassion for these people. This woman, Kat, did what she could, handing out tissues to strangers. This is Australia and the best thing we do is we look after our mates. Thousands of messages collected in condolence books to people firmly in their minds. I've just said much love and strength to everyone affected uh, by the events of yesterday and I just want to come and lay some flowers as a proud Sydney sider. Sydney's heart is broken, a pain shared by so many today standing together. Lizzie Pearl, Nine News. Let's go to crime reporter Simon Bowden now. And Simon, a major investigation underway to find out exactly what happened inside the cafe. Just explain what form that will take. Well, Georgie, it's been called a critical incident investigation. Now, that is a sort of investigation that happens every time there is a police shooting or a police officer is involved in a shooting. It will be led by the Homicide Squad. State Crime Command's Homicide Squad will lead that investigation. It will be overseen by the Professional Standards Command, which I guess is the old internal affairs, to ensure the integrity of that investigation. They will take statements from obviously all the police officers, all the surviving hostages, any witnesses to what occurred here at the Link Cafe. With those statements, they will then go to the coroner, the state coroner. They'll provide that evidence and it will be up to the coroner then to examine all that evidence, to conduct a hearing if need be, to determine exactly who fired the shots that left those two hostages dead. Georgie. All right, Simon, thank you. The hostages in the Lint Cafe were used as pawns by man Harren Monis, forced to pass on his demands in videos posted on social media. Three of the hostages also made phone calls to Nine News, bravely describing their situation and pleading for help. Yesterday, their faces were indistinct, their hands pressed against the windows of the cafe. But as the gunman became more desperate, he forced the hostages to relay his demands. Hi everyone, I'm Selena Wingpei. I'm one of the many hostages here at the Lynn Cafe at Martin Place. With someone holding an Islamic flag, they each showed extraordinary composure, referring to him as the brother. Among his demands, an ISIS flag and a phone call from the Prime Minister. Our ISIS brother has been very fair to us. He's helped us, given us water and let us go to the bathroom and help my medication. All he wants is a flag and a phone call from our Prime Minister. Another hostage was Marsha McHale. We don't understand why his demands haven't been met yet. They are not unreasonable. He's only asking for a flag and a phone call and that's it. Mid-afternoon, Marsha called the Nine Newsroom and I spoke to her directly. The gunman was listening to every word. Hi, Mark. Um, yep. Yeah, um, Firstly, I would like to say that um, we're okay, thanks to the brother. He has kept us safe and alive. However, there was a very uh, close, uh, you know, uh, missed call by people escaping and uh, we almost got shot in here. Um, however, we're still alive and we're all well. We spoke for nine minutes. The siege had been running for six hours. He would also like to speak to the Prime Minister. We understand the Prime Minister is a very busy man. Mm. However, I think, you know, the lives of quite a few people here are more important than whatever he's doing right now, whether he's playing I golf understand. or walking with his dog. I don't know what the hell he's doing. Yes. It cannot be more important than picking up the phone and making one phone call. That is not hard. The people that are sick, how are they? 
We have one pregnant lady that's not doing very well, and the other one is being very brave, but she's also not doing very well. Marsha was eventually carried from the cafe when the siege ended. One of the pregnant women she referred to was Julie Taylor. One, two, three. Oh, My name's Julie Taylor. I'm a barrister in Sydney. Um, this is a message for Tony Abbott. Like Marsha, Julie also called in. Remarkably, even though the gunman was standing just a metre away, she showed uncommon bravery. There are a few sick people inside and also two pregnant people. I'm, I'm pregnant and there's one other lady who's pregnant. Um, he says that he's made an offer um, to trade one flag of Islamic State for a life. Is he threatening you? Is he threatening you and the other people inside? Um, well, not exactly. Hmm. We've been given food and water and things like that. But everyone is a bit frightened. Well, of course you'd be frightened. How are you feeling? I don't feel so good. How does he seem to you? Does he seem agitated? Yeah. Julie had walked into the cafe to join friends for coffee and within minutes found herself being threatened. Does he have a gun? Yes. What kind of gun? I don't know. The big one? Does it have a long yeah. barrel? Uh, yeah. So it's a long like a rifle, is it? Yep. Julie was also in that frantic rush of hostages that stormed down Martin Place. While the hostages are free, their ordeal is anything but over. Julie Taylor is recovering in hospital, traumatised after being held at gunpoint for 17 hours. Three other women are recovering from gunshot wounds. As the gunman hovered yesterday, Marsha McHale delivered this plea. We don't want to die. There's a lot of people in here and we've got families. We, we want to go home, and we want to go home safe. Mark Burroughs, Nine News. The employees and the customers of the Lint Cafe were a cross-section of Sydney life, individuals just going about their normal business. And the confronting thing is, it could have been any of us. 17 Australians brought together by chance. Some of them were friends, some were strangers. All of them were innocent. Going about their daily Monday morning routine, barristers and baristas, bank workers and waitresses. All night, worried family and friends waited and watched. Just after 2am, this image brought relief for some. Among them, the parents of Harriet Denny, watching at home on Queensland's Sunshine Coast. When I first saw her running, I wanted to see that image again because I wanted to make sure it was her. But that image was not shown again because the next th thing that happened was the was the uh, the shooting and there's so much going on and I wanted to confirm that it was in fact her. They've closed their own coffee shop today, relieved after a sleepless night, yet to speak to their 30 year old daughter about what exactly she went through. She'd be handling it okay. She'd be really distressed by the by the death of her friend. Um, but uh, she'll be fine. She's a strong girl. The families of software workers Pushbendu Ghosh and Viswakanth Ankaredi also watched their escapes on TV. Hostage Fiona Ma left a message on her page for well wishes. Thank you, you beautiful souls. There was joy too for relatives of 19-year-old university student Jared Hoffman and Sydney barrister Stefan Balafutis. It's Ellie Chen's grief-stricken face that's been plastered across newspapers the world over after her escape last night. Her friends shared their relief on Facebook. You're amazingly brave. I prayed for you and so glad that you're safe. But there are two families today who received the worst possible news. This afternoon, colleagues and friends of Tori Johnson bravely returned to the scene. Carrying white roses, shedding silent tears, they were allowed under the police tape for a group hug, a sharing of stories, leaving their floral tributes. Everybody's just completely in shock by what's happened. Um, obviously it's a very young team that are down in Martin Place. They need a lot of support. The Lint employees were a close-knit group. Friends posting photos on Facebook today of happier times and messages to their colleague who's no longer with them. 
RIP Tory Johnson, you had a good heart and I knew you were in there protecting everyone. Jane as a party, Nine News. Reporter Vicky Jardim is at Royal North Shore Hospital and joins us now. Vicky, some of the hostages are being treated there. How are they faring? Well, Geordie, some 16 hours after the siege came to an abrupt end, five of the hostages are still in hospital and all are said by police media to be in a stable condition. Now, a 43-year-old woman underwent surgery here at the Royal North Shore Hospital after receiving a gunshot wound to her leg. A distant relative said it's likely that she will remain here in hospital for about a week to recover. A woman in her 30s has also been checked over by doctors because she is pregnant. Elsewhere, two other hostages are being treated for gunshot wounds wounds and a second woman has received a medical check because she is believed to be about 16 to 18 weeks pregnant. Now some good news, a police officer caught up in the crossfire was discharged from the Royal North Shore Hospital here this morning. He has actually told his boss that he'd like to return to work tomorrow so some, certainly some good news and let's hope the other victims receive a speedy recovery. Georgie? Indeed, Vicky, thank you very much. The man who ignited the siege in Martin Place started out as a blurry image behind the windows of the Lint Cafe, but police soon realised they knew him well. Self-styled Muslim cleric, 50-year-old man Haran Monas, was out on bail for sex offences and accused of being involved in his ex-wife's death. The search for answers begins. A dozen detectives raid the Belmore home of the man that brought terrorism to the heart of Sydney. Their simple question, the same as everyone across the country, why? An Iranian refugee, Man Monas came here to Australia to enjoy freedom. Liberties like our right to free speech, a right he gleefully learned to abuse. Are you Australians or American? It was 2007 when Monas sprung to the attention of authorities, sending a series of vile letters to the families of Australian troops who'd lost their lives in Afghanistan. We sat in our homes reading these letters. This man accusing my husband of being a child killer. It was the first of many times he'd sicken the nation. When you pick up the front page of the telly today, I think people... Um, I think uh, their stomachs turn. As his court case dragged on, Monas held a number of bizarre protests. He described himself as a Muslim cleric, but no Islamic centres recognised his claim, resulting in him being dubbed the fake sheikh. Monas eventually avoided jail on the hate mail charges, sentenced instead to 300 hours community service. But he was back in police sights again last year, following the shocking murder of his ex-wife, Nolene, who was stabbed and set alight in the stairwell of her Warrington apartment. Monas was charged with being an accessory to murder. His new girlfriend, Amira Drudis, charged with murder. But both were controversially granted bail, a decision which particularly disgusted the victim's family today. It could have been avoided if the system was, you know, right. Guys like that shouldn't be able to walk around anywhere in the world. Then, while awaiting trial, Monas was arrested again in April this year, slapped with more than 40 charges of sexual assault. Police accused the fake sheikh of claiming to be a spiritual healer, luring women to be treated by his so-called meditation and black magic. But on those charges, yet again, Monas was granted bail. This man that performed this act of terrorism, leaving two people dead, should never have been on the streets of Sydney. So why was a man with such a disturbing past, who faces so many serious charges, granted bail? Uh, the community has every right uh, to feel upset. Uh, I'm incredibly upset. I mean, I'm outraged. If, if this review um, shows that we need to do more, uh, I'll be doing more. Last Friday, Monas faced the High Court in a last-ditch bid to overturn one of the many rulings against him he failed. Then that may well have been the proverbial uh, straw that broke the camel's back that caused him to become unhinged. Monas raged over the weekend. On his website, which features photos of dead children, he spoke of the Muslim fight against the oppression and terrorism of the USA and its allies, including the UK and Australia. And then yesterday, dressed in Islamic headband and flag, he took his fight to the streets of Sydney. 
But why someone so dangerous was on our streets at all is the question that will now haunt so many in this city for a very long time. Well, Tom Steinfurt joins us now from State Parliament. Tom, changes to bail laws are on the way, but what's the hold-up? Well, look, Georgie, the uh, changes have been in the pipeline for some time and thankfully they will finally come into force next month. But as far as those delays go, well, the government's uh, blaming others for that. They say they're ready, but the people that will enforce them are still undergoing training. So the good news, yes, changes to the system are on the way, but clearly the bad news is that they are coming far too late for everyone involved in yesterday's siege. And it was put to the Attorney General today. Would Man Monis have been given bail if he was dealt with under these new reforms? And the simple answer was no, he would not have got bail. But because of these delays, the killer walked amongst us and unfortunately it had fatal consequences. All right, Tom, thank you. In the news ahead, inside one of the biggest police operations the country has ever seen. Sydney's Muslim community unites to condemn this act of terror. Also, how the world watched as the siege came to a dramatic end. And the bright spot on a dark day, the overwhelming reaction of Sydneysiders refusing to let terror divide the city. This is the scene right now at Martin Place where a makeshift shrine is growing for the victims of yesterday's deadly siege. While we've seen an increased presence of police on our streets in recent months, elite units of the state's force have been training for years in their high security compounds. And earlier today, all that training came into effect. It was 9.45 on a Monday morning, the middle of Sydney's CBD. Martin Place was teeming with people. Initially, officers thought they were responding to an armed robbery. What actually unfolded was one of the biggest police operations this city, this country, has ever seen. A gunman holed up in a busy cafe. Customers and staff now hostages. Martin Place was thrown into lockdown. Surrounding officers evacuated. The train station closed. An exclusion zone was declared, blocking off an area around the cafe bound by Elizabeth Street, St James Road, Macquarie and Hunter Street. A containment and negotiation plan was initiated. Over the course of the siege, five of the hostages managed to escape. And each time they did, they ran into the arms of officers, police who were prepared to storm the cafe when the order came. And that order went out when gunfire was heard inside. EA, emergency action, was immediately implemented. It was the point of no return. There was no turning back. The standoff would end here and now. The ultimate goal, to protect and rescue the hostages. Now the purpose of that, with the limited information that they had at the time, is to attack that stronghold and save the lives of those hostages in the event that the hostage taker starts killing hostages randomly. The highly trained officers from the Tactical Operations Unit were given no choice but to storm the building. Two groups of heavily armed police were stationed at the fire escape doors on either side of the Lint Cafe. Inside, 17 hostages held captive by armed gunman Man Monis for more than 17 hours. It's much better to wait, wear the guy down. They would have learnt very quickly that he was on his own because hostages escaped and would have given them that information. It was a few minutes past two. The Lint Cafe in darkness. Police began their assault by the most direct, the quickest and the most dangerous route. There was no time for stealth. With their guns drawn, they stormed the building, letting fly with a series of flashbangs non-lethal weapons designed to disorientate a person's senses with a blinding flash of light and a loud bang of more than 170 decibels. But that wasn't enough. Shots rang out. Monus was taken down. And they had no choice. Go in now and stop this. They stood in the line of duty for their city, for their country. Officers who are now being praised for the way they handled this terror crisis. Simon Boda, Nine News. It was just a few months ago in September that the federal government raised the terror alert level for Australia, a precaution they must have hoped would never become reality. But Prime Minister Tony Abbott has suddenly found himself dealing with our worst fears. 
After a sleepless night, Tony Abbott emerges from a crisis meeting of the National Security Committee. The sombre mood of a nation reflected on the Prime Minister's face. Our hearts go out to all of those caught up in this appalling incident and their loved ones. He ordered the flag be flown at half-mast and spoke on the phone with the police officer injured in the shootout before leaving Canberra, heading for Sydney to visit the New South Wales Police Operations Centre. Then, at a press conference with the Premier and police chiefs, he condemned the perpetrator. This has been an absolutely appalling and ugly incident. The Prime Minister acknowledges there are lessons to be learnt here and there are questions that need to be answered, like why was someone with such an extensive criminal history free? If I can be candid with you, well, that is the question that we were asking ourselves around the National Security Committee. How can someone like that uh, uh, be entirely at large in the community? And from the opposition leader, a call for unity. I hope in time there can be a permanent memorial to the victims of this horrific event. Kerry Yaxley, Nine News. In the news ahead, the Muslim community bands together to condemn the terror in Martin Place. Plus, the state's best and brightest celebrate HSC success. And surgery for Michael Clark, will he ever play again? From the minute it began until the final harrowing shots rang out, millions around the world watched the Sydney siege unfold. From the United States to Britain, there was shock and disbelief that this could happen in a country renowned for its peace and freedom. A dark day for Australia, watched by millions around the world. With the breaking news, the images seen around the world, the siege in Australia. Joining us is Simon Boda. He is a reporter for Nine News Australia. Hostage drama in a Sydney cafe appears to have ended. Police entered after a series of explosions. The New York Police Department moved quickly, deploying more officers to high-profile locations like the Empire State Building and Times Square. A lot of um, intelligence-driven, strategically-based, uh, high-profile police coverage. President Obama had this message for ISIS. But make no mistake, our coalition isn't just going to degrade this barbar barbaric terrorist organization. We're going to destroy it. Other world leaders express their concern via social media. The British Prime Minister describing it as deeply concerning. News organisations around the globe leading with the story about Sydney's Day of Terror. Australian police say the gunman was among three people to have died. You can't even go and have a cup of coffee without this happening. The British press also carried the story on all their front pages. The blanket coverage continued here throughout the day. America gripped by the lone wolf attack they too have been fearing. Could it happen here? In the United States, Christina Hearn, Nine News. An unattended backpack sparked a major security scare at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade headquarters in Canberra today. The bomb squad was called, staff evacuated and streets cordoned off. Investigators said the backpack had been left behind by staff and was not suspicious. Three of the four police officers charged with assaulting Brazilian student Roberto Curti during his fatal arrest have been found not guilty. The 21-year-old was repeatedly tasered on a CBD street in 2012. Scott Edmondson, Daniel Barling and Shinon Lim were today cleared, but Officer Damien Ralph has been found guilty of common assault. A fresh blow for Eddie Abid with the disgraced former Labor power broker stripped of his Order of Australia medal. It comes just days after he and former Minister Joe Tripodi were stripped of their honourable titles in the wake of corruption findings. A special honour today for our state's best and brightest, with the first in course awards announced, recognising the highest achieving pupils in each HSC subject. We did both um, participate two years in a row in the Latin poetry reading competition um, and were uh, winner and runner-up both times. Um, as, as, except for Greek, my friend. Oh, except for Greek. <laughs> HSC results will be available tomorrow from 6am. Good luck.
Sport is next with Tim Gilbert. Hi, Tim. Evening, Georgie. Steve Smith is ready to lead his country, but we'll hear why the Indians think he's no substitute for Michael Clark. An NFL team considers making an offer to league star Jared Hayne and more disappointment for the Wanderers at the Club World Cup. And we are expecting some rain between now and Christmas, but will Christmas Day be dry? I'll have your holiday forecast soon. We want to bring you now pictures just in of Martin Place in the heart of Sydney where there has been an extraordinary outpouring of grief. So many people leaving flowers and cards for the victims of the deadly siege. And among them were members of Sydney's Islamic community. Sharing in the pain being felt across the city, they were quick to condemn the lone gunman's violence. In the quiet gloom of the city last night, Three Muslim men pray for the Martin Place siege to end, hopefully, peacefully. Our hearts and prayers, you know, go out to the families that are missing their, their, their loved ones. As the ripples and ramifications of the siege coursed through Sydney and the rest of the country, Muslim Australians were vocal in their condemnation on the streets of Lakemba today. Things like that shouldn't be happening in Australia. It's actually very sad for us as an Australian citizen. I am also an Australian, and I'm, I'm proud of an Australian Muslim. We're putting in very hard work to build a life and helping a community and build Australia. And something like that is very set back for everyone. A coalition of 50 Muslim groups from around Australia were unanimous in condemning the attack, praying for the speedy recovery of those injured and traumatised. The communique also heralded the calm and measured reaction of Sydney signs, saying, we are confident community harmony will be maintained and that all Australians will be able to recover from the incident. But there are concerns that Muslims, in particular women, could be targeted in reaction to the surge. People should realise that we are part of the society of Australia. We're all Australians and we all feel the same way as any other Australians. But in a tsunami of social media response, tens of thousands of people pledged their support via the hashtag I'll Ride With You offering to accompany any Muslim who felt they could be a target on public transport. The tweet quickly becoming a worldwide trend. And that unification of emotion was evident throughout today at the memorial now ever spreading across Martin Place, where the offering of prayer continued from the night previous. We're in shock like everybody else is in shock and we're, we're standing with everybody else, not because we have anything to defend, not because we're involved, simply because we're Australians, we're neighbours, we're part of the community. Mike Dalton, Nine News. Coming up, a quick check of petrol and finance, plus Amber with the weather. Thank you very much, Georgie. It has been a very hot day, especially in our west. Right now, it is still 31 degrees in Penrith. I'll have your forecast next.